the world's, the world's writers will walk through those gates. And uh, if you hang around, you get a chance to talk to them. I'm interested in conversations that deal with things that matter, that real, you know, how do we live our lives? First of all, make climate change personal in your life. The second step is get angry and get active. And the third step, and believe it or not, I think this is the most important. We have to imagine this world that we want to hurry towards. But kindness is looking at people as people and not as I voted this, I do this, whatever it is. There are some people we will never get along with, but most of us, most of us are a complex mass of different things. I hope you enjoy your events in this year's digital program and that they spark in you thoughts and conversations and feelings. All the things that a good book should do and all the things that a wonderful book festival like Edinburgh International Book Festival does too. It's a book festival that's really dear to my heart. It's one of the first festivals I attended as a new author. I was part of the Outriders Africa program and every year returning to it feels a little bit like coming back to a literary home. It's such a pleasure to see them going online this year, and I'm so excited for the future of Edinburgh International Book Festival. Hello and welcome to Edinburgh International Book Festival 2020. My name is Noelle Cobden and I'm the Communities Programme Director at the Book Festival. This event is supported by the Players of People's Postcode Lottery and I'm really delighted to welcome you along today to join us for our Power to the People event. I think it's going to be a really interesting conversation. We've got two excellent guests joining us. This event is part of Citizen, which is our long-term creative programme working in partnership with organisations across Edinburgh and the Lothians. Citizen gives people in local communities the opportunity to explore ideas of identity, self, place and what it is to be a citizen in the world around us today. A world that I think we can all agree has changed somewhat in the last few months and over 2020. You know, we've had a pandemic looming large over us, we've been confined to our homes. And it feels to me like at the end of March, the world stopped turning and when it restarted, it was spinning in the opposite direction. But what does that mean for people in local communities? What does it mean for the organisations, the services, their neighbours, the other people that they interact with? How have they had to adapt and change over the last few months? How has it affected all of us? We know that central and local government have been doing their best to support us and to help us keep us safe. But without the mobilisation of grassroots organisations in the community and thousands of local volunteers, where would we be now? Those are just a few of the questions I'm hoping that um, our guest today can help me answer over the next 45 minutes or so. I'm really, really pleased to introduce Joel Hunter and John Lawton, who are joining me today, both extremely inspirational people who have um, founded organisations over the last decade that put people at the centre. And both of them are forever seeking to challenge the systems and the uh, procedures around policy, around power and around democracy in the country today, in particular helping people to raise their voices and being a part of the conversation that not everyone always gets to be part of. 
introducing Joel first. Joel Hunter is uh, the co-founder and CEO of 64 Million Artists, an organisation that sees and believes everyone is creative and that when we're creative, we can change ourselves and make real change to the world around us. Before 64 Million Artists, Joel was the Head of Strategic Development at Battersea Arts Centre and she's also a Clore Fellow in the Leadership Programme. Also joining us today is John Lawton. John is a local boy, he's a social entrepreneur and a youth worker and at the age of 11 he started his first campaign. He has spoken over those years since then to over a million people around in 55 countries around the world and has raised a staggering four million pounds for good causes over that time. And he is also the founder of Scran Academy, a local organisation who works with young people, training them up in catering skills to give them a better start in life. So welcome to you both so much. So great to see you. Um, the first thing to say for people who maybe watch book festival events on a regular occasion is that neither of our guests today are authors in a traditional sense, but they do very much deal in stories, particularly in supporting other people to tell their stories and raise their voices. So Joel, coming first to you, can we talk a little bit about your story to start us off and the story of how 64 Million Artists came to being? Um, am I right in thinking that you had a bit of a creative epiphany? Yeah, so I think I had, I'd worked in the kind of, I guess the formal art sector, but uh, you know, I'd worked in circus and street theatre, I'd done a lot around kind of singing and getting group, I did, used to run a lot of choirs and I was, I really, uh, I was passionate about enga engaging people in culture, but uh, I'd always come at that from a, a sort of, yeah, a formally funded arts venue or organisation. And I sort of got to the peak of where I thought I wanted to be. You know, I loved Battersea Arts Centre. It's an amazing place. And I was sort of operating a very strategic role there, you know, running their capital redevelopment, doing all sorts of uh, interesting work across public engagement. Um, and yet I still didn't really feel like myself I was having uh I'd just come out of a long relationship I felt quite anxious a lot of the time I started having panic attacks um and I what I did was I decided to take a bit of time off work and I took a month off and I asked different people to set me different creative challenges to do every day and for me that was a real challenge <laughs> because I was someone that was pretty obsessed with just getting everything right and being as perfect as I possibly could be and as long as that was as long as I was perfect everything would be fine and <laughs> um, so trying something new and taking a risk every day was it was difficult and it pushed me out of my comfort zone but I felt free and I felt excited and I felt I met so many people that I would never have met before and I thought this is what creativity is about it isn't about going and sitting and watching stuff it isn't about just listening to stuff it isn't about absorb you know it isn't just art is what artists do and they're the people that make everything we all are creative we all participate every day even if we don't think we do and that's the thing that I'm interested in in helping people discover about themselves so I quit my job two weeks into the 30 days uh brave decision uh, and started 64 million artists and since then that's we that's what we focused on so we do that in policy making we work on the ground with communities and with care homes and with schools uh, and all sorts of different people and we also work online with the January challenge for example which has about 30,000 participants every year taking part in daily creative activities. Fantastic thank you Joe. and John bringing you in there obviously Joe has, has talked a bit about you know everyone being creative. And I think one of the things that I know about you is that you are really keen that everyone can can kind of um, access their own potential, I guess. So for you and your story, John, you've spoken publicly um, about the fact that you had a difficult upbringing and that you're from an area of Edinburgh where maybe people don't get that, have that much of a voice um, in the sort of bigger conversations in society. So what made you age 11 want to start campaigning and then you know going on into the future and thinking about Scran Academy and and where did the idea for that come from? Well hello my name my name is John <laughs> I'm told I overthink I'm told I crave to be in control and I don't know when to rein my neck back in I make adults sometimes feel uncomfortable because I try and always speak the inconvenient truth but I never apologize for it anymore because my passion is for a generation of let down youth in all our lives, the old saying goes, 
that our parents want us to have better than they got. But for kids like me, that was a promise we all forgot. Struggling kids often break and we all watch them crack. But it's not until we own our own stories that we can get our own lives back on track. And for me, whether it's Scran Academy or my first campaigns in anti-poverty and anti-drugs work as a, as a young pre-teen boy in Pilton and Muirhouse in North Edinburgh, it's the same attitudes and internal lessons we need to learn as how we're fighting COVID. Um, because if I look back as a wee boy then, I was never told I was going to succeed. I never went to one of the schools that anyone wants to talk about. Um, Mum and dad never. I was never um, raised with a, a culture of ambition and positivity and creativity and ingenuity, and, you know, with, a, with, a, with an expectancy to go on and be anybody or do anything. And actually sometimes it's um, in these areas where the greatest innovation, um, demonstration of the good bit of humanity and, and the raw creativity can show. Um, I ran my first campaign age 11, not because I wanted to or because I was interested in being a campaigner, but because there was no other option. Pensioners were judging kids, kids were left on the streets, parents were struggling with addictions and financial problems and poor housing and, and being written off. And just something triggered in me quite, quite early that you're the best person to change your own life. Fast forward a decade and a half and I, I, you know, I'm now a leadership coach and we set up charities and I do lots of social entrepreneurship. Um, that's actually true scientifically. You cannot manage anyone else's behavior other than your own. Um, and so for me, I just had this raw view that people in poverty, people struggling with these issues that are too often just topics in a political book or you know, distant narratives in a media headline, um, we didn't always get the big words right. We didn't always look sexy or eloquent in the way that you know the, the, the corridors of discourse demand sometimes, but um, it's raw and it's real and it's proper. And I think there's something very beautifully um, authentic about having these stories be told at any point in history, but particularly now more uh, than ever with COVID. And, the biggest narrative I want to challenge is everyone's going, oh my God, the world's so different. You know, we're all struggling. Do you know what? If chaos and struggle was a big part of your story five months ago, the world's not that different. There's just a, bu a bunch of middle class or kind of comfortable people who kind of feel a little bit of what you've got for a, a small part of their life. And our experience with Scran Academy and my other work shows that people who were already at the bottom, who were struggling, are actually dealing with it bloody remarkably. They've got an inbuilt resilience to have to survive. Um, they're, they're not complaining that they're on furlough and they've lost 20% of anything. They're, you know, they're not complaining that, um, oh, I can't get out to get my um, pumpkin spice lattes every morning on my way to, to work, which is what I sometimes still complain about now. I've managed to kind of sort things out a wee bit for myself personally, but there's an amazing amount of respect in the core nucleus of human beings by working in communities that were otherwise written off. Um, and I think it's, I, I've been very inspired by what they're doing and it's brought me back to my starting point in, in, in the kind of tougher streets of the world of rebus and train spotting, um, as opposed to um, enlightened thinkers or, or kind of political leaders, if you like. Thank you, John. And one of the things that you, you've touched on there, which I think is so interesting, and I've actually been talking about it before, is the idea of power and, you know, people, you have to take power, you know, and we hear a lot about organisations and government as well talking about how they are doing things to empower people and actually oh, only you as a person can empower yourself, other people can't do it to you. So Joe, thinking about that and the way that you work and, and the creative challenges that, um, that 64 Million Artists kind of focuses on, how, how do you feel that that kind of encourages people or provides a platform for people to find their own power? Yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right. And yeah, I think what's important is that there are like, I think in order to find your own power, you need to have the conditions created for you often for that to happen. Like often, you know, if you're living a busy and chaotic life, you, you know, it, sometimes that's a really challenging place to start from in order to find that. And yet, like John says, often people are finding it all the time. Um, so what we would say is, you know, one of the things that we do, for example, you know, a lot of the people that we work with, people say, oh, you know, 
we talk a lot about co-creation and, and, and some people say, well, we came along, we asked them what they wanted and they didn't know or they didn't say. And we were like, we would say, well, that's because it's very rare that those people um, ever get asked what they want. You know, we did this huge project with older people in Leicester and a lot of those people that we were working with, you know, in their whole lives, it was very rare that people had asked them their opinion or what it was that they wanted or how they would want it to be. Um, and so, yeah, it was hard to go into a room and just say, OK, now you're empowered. <laughs> Tell us what you want. It's not like it doesn't work like that. So what we do is we kind of use creativity and kind of this idea of like doing little things daily or working in groups together to kind of try things that don't feel you know, they don't feel big or scary. They're small little things that you can do in five or 10 minutes or they're, you know, talking, just prompts for talking in a slightly different way to start to build towards uh, growing people's sense of creativity, which to me is freedom, self-expression, being able to say what you want and what you like and how you want to choose things and growing a bunch of people around you that also have that. And so we, that's the way that we tend to work. And we often, one of the things that we do a lot of is that we, you know, we're a national organization. So we know that we, you know, we're not the best people to go into any community uh, apart from our sort of online community uh, and, you know, be at the center of it uh, because those communities have been there for ages and, you know, we want them to sort of fly in and fly out again. So what we do a lot of is we work with probably, you know, people like John, people like, but people in the center of communities. So often, for example, a teachers in a school community or an activity called Network and Care Home or community work or lots of youth workers. Um, and we work with them to sort of look at how you kind of put in every day, how you use everyday creativity in your communities uh, and help them to support others to do that. But yeah, I think ultimately, it, you know, for me, there's such an interesting line. One of the things I'm sort of fascinated by is this kind of balance between saying, you know, everyone is in charge of their own destiny and everyone can make anything that they want to happen. And there are loads of systemic inequalities in society that make that much harder for some people than others. So we're really interested in like, you know, how do you work with that line around, you know, helping people, yes, to take extra steps to you know to come into their own power essentially and also recognizing how challenging that is and so always trying to balance that interesting thank you and um john thinking then about the the people that you work with and particularly thinking about the young people that scran academy works with what is the kind of starting point that you um you do with them how do you kind of bring them in to the organization and and encourage them to you know find their power and to raise their voices um, in a way we don't. We have to first of all accept that empowerment properly done is always taken. Mm. It's never given. Yeah. Um, otherwise, you set out with an end point in mind and actually the, you risk starting to uh, predefine what their journey of growth should be like. And to use Joel's point, true creativity should probably never really have a, an end point um, really overly defined. You might have a goal or a direction of travel. Scran Academy was an experiment. I was away working in London for a decade, working in Downing Street and big organisations like the Prince's Trust and set up my own business. I came back to Edinburgh and I thought, I want to make sure I'm throwing down as many ladders as I can for other kids like me who were judged, written off and struggling silently to have a fair crack at the, the whip um, and to get on in life. And um, I went back to my old school um, I worked in my, my old neighbourhoods, connected with people I hadn't seen for a very long time. Um, and we decided to set up a business. And that bit's really important. We're not just not just a charity. The young people came up with the name Scran Academy. And the whole idea was, let's focus on what young people can do, not what they haven't got. And there's something about an asset mindset, an asset model, not the deficit. Let's not fix your broken bits. We know that in business theory, we know that in psychology, we know that in recuperation and recovery, the way you get on is to focus on the good bits, gravitate and grow what works, not highlight the, the, the pain bits, if you like. So Scran, very simply, was an experiment to try and blend the traditional sectors of the private world, the public world, um, and the voluntary sector. So we are a community-based organization that runs as a social enterprise, that takes young people out of a school setting into a community-based education setting, 
using third sector and youth work models to help them gain the qualifications, skills, experiences and positive adult connections they need to go and succeed. I say to every youth worker I've ever employed, you might be the only adult that says please or thank you to that young person this week. You might be the only person that genuinely wants to hear the response. You might be the only person that's not turning up with a badge or a lanyard who is a well-meaning but ill-placed, given to them professional that's there to fix them, to tick a box, read the case study, then off the jot. What Scran is, is about unlocking the tenacity of their own kind of human spirit to say, you can redefine your own narrative, your own paradigm on what it is you want to be, not everything you've never, never had. And put simply, we, we work with kids who are struggling inside mainstream school and we give them an alternative package of support. But they don't do that by being told to turn up on time, sit in uniform, yes sir, no sir, three bags of um, sweets or whatever. It's more about what kind of business do you want to run? How can we use your talents to, to be really successful? Um, and we set up with zero pence. Um, at, we'd set it up um, in partnership with Mould Hospitality, home economics teacher in school. Um, and we had no big need to be huge. We had no need to get it right. We just wanted to snowball towards um, something that was ours. And we would fundraise and we'd keep the money in the local area. We weren't you know, jumping off to any big funders or corporate donors or blah, 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 blah. Um, and we've just grown really from there. Um, and those young people give me the inspiration and the energy and my staff team every single day. Um, I was, um, until four months ago, the chair of the board and the founder, not kind of chief executive of the team. We had um, two part-time members of staff um, our turnover last year was like 30, 30, 30 grand. We're very, very small. Um, and COVID-19 has seen us now take in 210 um, frontline key workers. Um, we've generated into six-figure sums of money in response mode. This week, the, the young people and the staff will have delivered 100,000 free healthy meals out to the community. Um, with quite a it's not just a scattergun. We built a referral process. We built a, a data management system. We built up in place um, a delivery network that targeted those at highest risk of COVID. Um, and it's funny because if I'm fitting my model or my passions to meet a funding bid or a media headline, the people we work with, the places we live, are the people who should be the recipients of a service. Yet these guys are actually the designers and the architects of a service. And entrepreneurship or social activism, you know, power of the people, whatever way you want to call it, ultimately it's a, in this era, it's, a, it's an equation between the level of risk out there and, and, and how strongly you feel what your passion is to help. And that risk versus purpose. Um, and we've chosen to focus really on the purpose not just the risk. We never do purpose assessments, but we always do risk assessments. So our purpose assessment was get those young people in as safely as we can. And if you make them feel like they're part of something, they feel good about themselves. They're giving back. Giving back shouldn't just be the, for the philanthropists that make it. But these young people being able to give back and run it themselves has been amazing. And, and the two things they always say to us is, you treat us like adults and like res with respect, it's something we never usually get. And the second thing is, you actually believe in me and think I can do this. And when we believe in them, that cultivates the environment for the young people to believe in themselves. And that's what the reality is of power to people. Actually, I never set out to give you power, but I set out to love you. I set out to respect you, to work with you, to trust you, to believe in you. And then that's where they foster the empowerment and take that for themselves. And they create that identity of feeling empowered. And, I believe that um, there's no greater definition of freedom than somebody that is completely at peace and in, in, uh, in love with themselves, because then the doors open up to go where they want. And that's what we're trying to do with young people. Thank you. And uh, Joe, uh, John obviously talked there about kind of the shift that Scran Academy has done um, since COVID has happened to us in the last few months. So. Um, from your perspective, how has 64 Million Artists changed in the way that you work with communities over this time? Yeah, it's been a, a fascinating time, obviously, as it has for lots of people. And I think for us, it was interesting because we have, strangely enough, over the last sort of couple of years, we have, we've always 
struggle to get public funding like I think people don't we're not really arty enough for the art people (laughs) and we're not sort of we're not in terms of our sort of social outcome then we're not you know we're a bit too arty for them so so it's it's been a really interesting thing and we've ended up doing a lot of kind of commissioned and client-based work and you know using uh, we're a non-profit social enterprise so we you know we work with corporate clients for example and then bring the money back to do the free stuff that we want to do um and what's been so fascinating is that during this time we have uh we've really grown the we we were sort of relatively you know the way that we were able to flex and adapt online meant that most of our sort of client work we were able to kind of keep or postpone but still be paid for we you know we managed to sort of keep financially okay Um, And what we decided therefore to do is to really take a risk to do the stuff that we knew needed doing in our communities because we were seeing people feeling at sea, frightened, feeling really alone. You know, one of the things that we feel so proud of in our work is, um, you know, for a lot of people who take part in our work online, for example, they're often, you know, they have high Uh, anxiety or depression or they have chronic uh, illnesses that keep them at home we have a lot of people taking who you know who are dealing with massive life events and being part of our community really helps them through that and we really recognize that there was a need so I remember like you know we sort of went into lockdown I I think we left the office on the Wednesday I got COVID-19 on the Friday and we started, I think, a two-week challenge. We just thought, right, we're just going to start something. We're just going to do it. You know, that's what we're passionate about doing. We don't know what's going to happen financially, but what we know is is important to start, and we're just going to do it. So we we started a two-week challenge. I think that you know, basically, almost as soon as we went into lockdown, just to kind of see how it went. We had thousands of people sign up. People at the end were just sort of saying, "God, oh God, I, this was just exactly what I needed in the first two weeks. Please do this again." Uh, and so then we started. Uh, we did a a month long program in May called Create to Connect. And the idea we really focused on, we worked with different partners from all over the country. So we worked with community organizations and arts organizations and artists and uh, community leaders and really, really interesting bunch of people to kind of specially create li- these sort of little daily prompts for people to do, think about and share. So they, they started, uh, you know, we had communities online doing them, but what we also did was we created smaller WhatsApp groups because we did a a study with UCL recently that showed that people with um, low level mental health issues had, uh, there was a clinically significant result to show that their mental health had improved, their depression, anxiety, and stress had reduced during doing these uh, challenges together in these small WhatsApp groups. So we we focused on doing that. We uh, also, and what we also did was we put some packs together, which was, which basically meant that a youth worker or a community worker or someone who, you know, used to run online, uh, used to run in-person groups or an uh, in-person community ha- could have a bunch of resources ahead of the month to do it themselves online and tips for how you run online groups and tips for um, also getting to people offline. So how could you work in your immediate community by sharing letters each day? So that the idea was the challenges also helped you do that. So there was lots of stuff around post or um, calling people up or, you know, because we recognize that a lot of, a lot of the people that take part don't, you know, don't have regular access to digital. Um, so looking at, you know, how could we adapt all of this stuff so that people could come together? And what was so beautiful hearing about it was, you know, we just, we just put a, put our resource into it we just you know we've got people we'll just do it we'll see what happens and we had you know I think about 7,000 people were signed up uh well probably more than that over the for the two challenges um just to get the emails but in terms of then the people that were taking part who were through the packs that you know that it turned into tens of thousands um and you know people were saying you know the news is so stressful I'm finding it so difficult you know I have ADHD I have anxiety I you know find the news so stressful every day and yet this is just it makes me feel calm it gives me a, that a sense of purpose you know like John you know for one of the things that I think is so important around mental health is that idea of feeling like I've got a purpose even if that's like a day a sm- tiny small daily purpose or <laughs> a really long-term big purpose you know sometimes you you in order to feel well you need to have a sense of you know, something to get you out of bed. And I think, you know, people really found that that was, you know, becoming a vital part of their day. And then also, you know, the the amount of sharing that we saw in the groups online where people were saying, you know, I, 
I'm really struggling today. And so all I've done is this, you know, and they'll just post something, you know, it's certainly nothing that we do is about sort of quality of output. It's about having a go and seeing what it's like. And no one ever says, oh, I didn't like, you know, didn't think you should have used red there. <laughs> you know, they say, that's really hard that you're having a tough day. I hear you, you know my daughter's ill as well I'm really worried about her you know you, you know thanks for going into work you know we had key workers doing it too and you know what was so it was so nice to see this sort of coming together of people and and I think you know that's always been the connection element has always been a massive part of our work um but for us it's just made us so so much more passionate to kind of take this moment and live our value you know we always have lived our values but we we want to say, you know, now this is, you know, this is the work that's important and we're going to spend all of our time trying to make this work happen. So we are, you know, we're taking on a new member of staff. We're moving as a team to a four day, a full pay four day week, because that's important for our well-being. Uh, you know, we are pursuing the, you know, funding again, having not had any public funding to try and continue some of this work because, you know, I th yeah, times like this make you realize what's important doesn't it and and the work that we do is is really affecting people and so we're really excited about you know putting all our energies there and one of the things you were just talking about there Joe which I think is so true is about that idea of connection and and I think connection is so important when we talk about community um, John I watched a video that you put out quite near the start of lockdown and you were talking about the fact that we shouldn't be calling it social distancing we should be calling it physical distancing because actually we are social animals and we need that connection with people so I wondered what have you guys done um through Scran Academy in terms of with the people that you're meeting when you're delivering food to, how are you kind of trying to, or have you been trying to sort of um, foster a, a sort of a social relationship with those people? Because obviously the majority of them have been isolating. I, I mean, community, togetherness, connection is so important. We, it is a core need of us as humans. Um, I always say that we try to pivot to become a, a fifth emergency service not because our lasagna's delicious, not because our shepherd's pie's free, not because our pasta's al dente, but because our drivers and our volunteers will turn up at your door, say hello, say if you're okay, and remind you that as a community, we all bloody love you. And to deliver that little slice of community, that we portion of happiness, that we serving of concern when nobody has to do it, is dead important. The narrative to people living in isolated or financially volatile lives is often a conversation to them from services they never meet, telling them what they will or won't get because of their entitlement level. Sorry, Mrs Cassidy, you're not quite disabled enough for that extra benefit. Sorry, you don't quite care for your mum enough, 16-year-old boy, to receive a young carer's allowance. Sorry, um, Donna, you earn 85p an hour too much, so you're, there's not a working tax credit for you. It's all about with qualification in the bad way. Um, and we say, you're a human who needs help, so you qualify. Um, and what we've found in this um, is the state, in its most meta sense, is really crap at responding quickly and efficiently and um, with any sort of personal touch. So as agencies like ourselves, we're often called the third sector, but I see us as the first sector because we're often the first to respond. We're the first to get called by the people who need us the most, yet we're the easiest to forget about when it comes to funding and having our voice heard. So if we talk about power to the people, one solution is really give a voice to the, the, the voluntary and community sector because their sole existence is for those people. They're not trying to secure power through election and they're not trying to secure profit through commerce. That is our commerce. That is our election day. Um, and so when we turn up, you know, Mrs. Cassidy, who's 85, um, she's told us that, you know, she's lived on her own for years. She's been afraid. She's been scared. And she actually was petrified to go out. She had no one else. And she literally said she thinks we helped save her life. That's powerful. Or when Eddie gets in touch and say, listen, Moira been at my door three times a week and just asking me how I'm okay and having a chat. I get, I get excited about it. I look forward to it. 
or hearing Kimberly and Nidji, the single mum, who tells us that her four kids got to know Darren who drops the food off and they all get excited to wave to him from the window and because they get to say hello to the nice man who brings the, 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 the Easter eggs and the shortbread that day, I think, or whatever it was. <laughs> um, but that's, that, that's unity, that's togetherness. It's these wee stories that wipe people's days up. And I could tell you the sad stories. Even this morning, I got a call from office manager telling me that one of our clients unfortunately had passed away. Well, the whole narrative we're all working in, in, in our enlightened spot is, how do we transition out of the COVID period? How do we go from reaction to rebuilding? Well, how do we rebuild when we're being told people are dying still? And we've got to remember that's a, that's a daily um, reality when we're at the, the kind of coal face for that. And so that's been really important. But the other story I want to tell is around um, the very basic goodness in people. Um, I had no infrastructure. I didn't own, have a kitchen. I had two part-time youth workers who worked two days a week. Um, we didn't have a referral database. We didn't have a, a, a huge network as a big organization. We built that apparatus from scratch. And people are going, how did you do this? What made you start? And you go, well, what would have happened if we didn't do it? And it's these individual stories of 3,035 people who got deliveries every day of our food when they needed it that made it all worthwhile. And whether it's children with a, with a mum who's just struggling to keep going, or it's a, a pensioner on their own telling us my husband died three weeks and I've lived with them for 60 years, I don't know what I'm going to do now. That's the connections that's really, really powerful and really important. And again, I come back to the heading of today's conversation, power to people. Sometimes the best way to get power to people is to make sure we as an as a infrastructure are empowering those people who are actually helping others. Get behind a leader. Sometimes be the number two, so to speak, in an organisation that goes and says, I want to follow you, I trust you, I believe in you. And that's what 210 volunteers have done for me. They never worked with us. We didn't know the vast majority of them. We created jobs and roles or in delivery drivers and couriers and kitchen cooks. And, and, and they've just, um, there's, a, there's a saying in my world, in youth work, that it takes an entire village to raise one single child. And that kind of feeling has been the same here, that it's taken in the great and the good of all of us to be able to create one program that can help. And we've just done our only bit in our, our part of it, in our patch. And, and um, we grew from working with 15 young people in one postcode to running a citywide operation. So it's completely transformed us as an organisation. But the story here isn't for me Scran's changed completely and we've created this big monster and we've completely pivoted because people would say that it was a lack of vision, it's mission drift, that wasn't in my business plan, how did you risk assess that, blah blah blah. I've not got time for that pal. I've got time for being in the game, I'm going to screw it up, I'm going to get it wrong, but do you know what, I'll tell you I did, I'll ask how to learn and I'll do it better tomorrow. Mm. And that's how you grow, that's creativity, that's power, is being able to trust in your own um, purpose as opposed to getting it perfect before you start. Um, but that's the conversation we need to have. There's a lot of organizations who are timid, who are scared to come back, but that's understandable. We now live in um, a culture of anxiety, collectively. And I think it's gonna be fascinating to see who, who gets there, at what pace, how quickly can we respond to overcome our own struggles and my plea to anybody watching this, I think there's a plea to the book festival with its platform, to 64 million artists, all the work we're doing. Struggle and, and pain is now an irreversible in terms of what's just happened to us all. But we've got two choices. We can let it define us, or we can own it and let it refine us. And I'm in the business of how do we let this all refine us and fuel us, rather than break us and beat us and separate us and make us scared and, and bitter. How do, let's get better. And for me, that next stage is, is going to be a really pivotal time for, for us as a set of communities. Mm. I, I think as well that there's a real, what I'm seeing in a lot of cultural organisations, for example, is a contraction. You know, there, there's a worry that at this moment, people, when you feel fear, you contract and you move away and you think, I'll do the basics. I'll do the step by step. And of course, you know, for some people, that is how they just need to be data, you know, like in order to manage themselves fine but yeah I completely agree with you I think really when things are thrown up in the air there is a moment for making it different you know I think structures are so hard to unpick and yet actually here's a moment that they're already unpicked you know things have completely changed and so 
if we go back, you know, if we move back and try and fit it all together the way it was before, it will never work. And so actually now's the moment to, to make really bold choices. And I'm, I'm scared that that won't happen in the cultural sector. Uh, and I, you know, for me, I feel quite removed from it now. I don't work in a venue. I don't, you know, it feels far from my life. And, and yet I think it will continue to feel far from my life unless it adapts to be revolutionary and exciting and part of its community and run by with and for people you know like it's you know people's you know the bo- it's never easier now to hear the voices of people you know that we, we can go out and talk to people more there's more time to do that and I, yeah I, it, it really is feels like a definitive moment to me I think you're absolutely right about that both of you and I think um, one of the things I wanted to kind of round up with, which is considering we're kind of coming to the end of our time anyway, was actually, you know, we hear a lot about that. The phrase build back better is being bandied around a lot at the moment. Um, now, obviously, both of you in the way that you work are absolutely activists and are and are pushing the boundaries and want to challenge you know, the world and society and we live in. But for us as individuals or small communities watching this, what are the steps we personally can take? Um, to kind of to, to help build back better how do we harness all that amazing energy and connection and sense of community that has built over this sort of four month period and how do we keep going how do we keep pushing forward John what do you think right I'm going to um, one of the most um, life-changing points I've ever had there's two I, I'd have had a similar speech twice one of them wait for the clang was in the White House right in DC <laughs> And then I did a similar thing at the Hydro in Glasgow. Um, I've chosen very early to wear my, um, I, co- I wear my shit on my sleeve, right? I want to share the, the share bits because we didn't learn anything from a cosy ego self-image. We learn stuff by being really vulnerable and open and honest um, about all the hard bits and the sore bits. I talk about my mental health challenges and my suicide attempts. I talk about the drug use in my, my, fa- my house. I talk about the abuse. I talk about being evicted from the council. I talk about the detachment and the otherness systematically in my whole life and what that does to someone's head. You're not always the greatest dinner party guest when you're dealing with crap like that, right? But I've, I've failed all my life. Um, and I think we all recover by being accepting that we're all going to fail. We're all going to feel. We're all going to feel rubbish and we're all going to and struggle, but how do we fail in the right direction? How do we have a culture of openness? Um, and even when things feel bad, I can still choose to react good. Even when you don't like me, I can still choose to love you. Even when it's not my problem, I can still treat you like a brother or sister and, and want to be there for you. Um, and I actually don't want to bounce back better. That's crap. I want to bounce back bloody different. Well, it's not just respond and react. That's patronising, ultimately. There's no power in there. With respect, my lasagna or our haggis, sneeps and tatties, or, it's not going to change that person's life just because of the meal. But what that means to them, the codification of appreciation, of togetherness, of unity, the collaborations that bonds, that's the spicy, special, delicious bit. <laughs> so what can we all do to be kind and to be positive? Um, together to give us a collective voice to then say all COVID's done for a lot of people is highlight a lot of the problems that have always been there for so many. How do we completely restructure this? Can this give us an energy and a refocusing on this experiment of, um, and I mean socialism in the non-political sense, in the sense of collectively? I really am worried that we will go back to only caring about the length of our commute who's got the fanciest bike um, and, and getting back onto a big, better job. How do we just think about the we, not, not just the me, and um, reform the narrative coming off of this? And I think it's, it's really simply back yourself and love yourself. Be on your side and people like you. Be, choose to be kind even when the world feels a bit crap to you. Um, and for me, that core, that core thing around accepting yourself and, and being willing to accept others individually is the most powerful um, internal mantra I think we can all have um, as we all come out of a kind of shared period of hurting although you know there's that phrase we've all been in the same storm we're all in different boats and um, give a bit of your boat 
bring somebody in who's struggling a wee bit. There's a wee word in Scotland which means dinghy, which actually means to ignore somebody. And a lot of people have been dinghied for a long time, and that means they've been in a very tough boat, but they've also been ignored. So let's sort of bring them in and no dinghy them. Um, and I think that's that's my my bit of um, that's my own advice to myself. So that's that's what I tell me. And Joel, what about you? Have you got any kind of tips of things that people could do? I guess I mean a, a lot of similarities to John, but I think you know getting things wrong is the is the is the thing that I feel like we're sort of forgetting how to do in society. Like I feel like for the last few years, especially, you know, you've had to have one opinion or the other. You know, it's black or it's white. It's you know, it's, it's it, there is no middle ground, and actually, we all exist in the middle ground all the time. And I think we've all become a bit scared to get things wrong. And actually, unless you can be willing to get things wrong, no one's going to get anywhere. Like, and I think for me, that's why the kind of practice of creativity, you know, whatever that is, you know, is has transformed me because I was definitely one of those people. Like I was rubbish <laughs> at getting things wrong because I just my you know my whole life was you know built on this. Oh, I've I've got to look. You know, it's got to be like this and it's got to be like this. And I feel so much happier as a result like don't get me wrong I sometimes my anxiety is higher and then it's not at all whereas before I used to exist constantly in this like slight underlying sense of anxiety all the time every day and I don't have that anymore and that is brilliant because I'm not as scared to get things wrong as I was um but what I would also say that I think is really important is there are especially for the people doing this work so the people who are doing the work on the ground who are changing you know I, I look around and I see the people that I feel really excited to talk to for the community activists and then and a lot of them are burning out <laughs> and it, and they are they're working really hard and they're pushing themselves to get their voices heard and the thing that I also think is important in this time is to really look after yourself you know I have had this long haul COVID thing I got it on the 20th of March I'm still struggling with it now and it has taught me the lesson that I've been sort of waiting to learn all my life which is that you I am at my best when I feel rested so if I rest for three days and I work for one that day of work will be way better than if I work for four days like and it, and it seems so counterintuitive but it has and it, I didn't feel like that. And I still am not having having days where I don't feel like that at all. I still feel like, oh, I'm not doing enough and I should be doing this and da, da, da. But actually, it's true. You know, when I I need to trust myself that when I when I look after myself, I work best. So it, the priority, even though that feels so hard and it feels so hard, you know, when you are, you know, struggling with money you're struggling with your family you're shut in a place with someone you don't like very much that is you know that is tough to say I'm just gonna I'm just gonna look after myself you know when you've got kids running around you need feeding you know that is a tricky thing to do and yet if you don't do it you are not serving the people around you well you've got to look after yourself in order to look after others and don't forget that second bit look after them too <laughs> but you know but do make sure you take care of yourself thank you um, thank you both so much. It's been such an enjoyable conversation and I could sit and chat to you about all this for way longer than we've got, sadly. Um, but yeah, thank you, Joe and John. It's been really, really wonderful, and very insightful. Um, a couple of final things from me. Uh, the first thing is to remember that we have an online bookshop now, which is shop.edbookfest at uh, sorry, shop.edbookfest.co.uk. I'll get it right eventually. Um, if you've enjoyed today's conversation and you'd like to find out more about our citizen project or the other work that we do year round at the book festival, we have a blog. And in fact, uh, we've got a blog that's just gone up recently about this idea of failure, particularly in the schools. So that's quite interesting. It's, it ties in quite nicely with what you've both just been saying. Um, and our blog is ontheroad.bookfest, sorry, .edbookfest.co.uk. Um, we also have two other citizen events as part of the book festival online this year. One of them is about healing the digital divide and Joe, you touched on that as well. So that's very nice. You, it's as if I prepped you both, but I didn't. Um, and we also have our citizen community meal coming up, which we are working in partnership with the lovely Scran Academy. So if you are watching from Edinburgh or Musselburgh um, and you would like a free meal to go along with watching the event, you will be able to do that. You'll be able to order one and lovely Scran Academy team will deliver it to your house, which is very exciting. Um, and that event will also involve members of our citizen project and um, all the participants from different communities across Edinburgh sharing some of the wonderful work that they've produced over the last couple of years. 
Um, and the final thing to say is from us is um, a big thank you to the players of People's Postcode Lottery who have helped make this event possible. Um, and also, as you'll know from signing up for this event, it, all our online festival is free of charge this year. So if you do have an extra pound or two hanging around, I know times are tight, so if you don't, no worries. But if you do and would like to donate to the book festival, um, particularly to help our community work, there is a donate now button at the bottom of the screen. Um, that is all from us. Thank you so much for joining us um, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you.